When I say the words engineer, artist, playwright, author, whose names do these conjure up in your mind? <laughs> Is it Imhotep, Archimedes, maybe Zhuglian, Abbasim Thanas, Alhazen, Shen Kuo, Al Jazeera? Or maybe you're a little bit more Western educated. Maybe it is Leonardo and Michelangelo who come to mind to begin with. Teki Udinin, Akbar the Great. Maybe you're from a little bit south of here and you think of Thomas Jefferson. Maybe you're from a large country that used to be on the other side of the political divide and you think of a recent person by the name of Pavel Florensky. Well, to this, morning, this afternoon, I'd like you to think about perhaps adding one more name to that list. This person was uh, educated at Imperial College in London in the 1960s, and after a little industrial experience, he came to McMaster in 1969. And he has served the university as both chair of the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering and as dean of the Faculty of Engineering. And this person is widely known for fundamental contributions to the recruitment of computational tools in the art of engineering design, and in particular in the art of designing microwave systems. A fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a member of the Canadian Academy of Engineering, Fellow of the IEEE, a winner of the Canadi IEEE Canada's McNaughton Gold Medal, and a winner of two awards for technical achievement from the IEEE Microwave Theory and Techniques Society, the Application Award in 2004 and the Career Award in 2013, and a winner last year of the QE2, the Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal. This person is not only an academic, but a true entrepreneur. Successfully established a company that was eventually acquired by Hewlett Packard. And over his career, he has, uh, has, has had his research broadly supported by industrial sponsors. This person is also an amazing technical mentor. And the department that I now supervise has benefited greatly from the membership of two of the people that he has mentored in their research development. This person is not just an engineer. This person has written eight stage plays, three of which have been performed and one of which him, he directed. He's written novels, screenplays and short stories. He's painted, as we can see. And with that in mind, I really would like you to think about another name to put on your list. We have the privilege of that person being here with us today to share with us his accumulated wisdom on the path from creativity to success. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to give a warm welcome to John Bandler. Yeah, thank, thank you very much, Tim. That was really quite unexpected and uh, very warm. I, I appreciate so many people coming here, being here today. Uh, this is a great opportunity. This, uh, this talk is, as, as, as you can see, hosted by the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering, but is something that has been thrown open to the public, uh, university-wide, and hopefully almost everyone in this audience will find uh, something that they can uh, relate to. Uh, one of the things that I do, I tend to ad lib, it's not a prepared speech. Uh, I have some, a lot of slides which I will go through fairly quickly, they'll prompt me. But at the same time, I may ask you questions. So be prepared that I may point uh, at you and ask you a question. Uh, don't be afraid, there is no right and wrong answer to those questions. Um, most of the questions will be quite subjective. So there is really no right and wrong answer to many of the things that I will say. On the other hand, some of you may become quite annoyed, uh, and, and if you are, that's actually a good thing, because I prefer any emotion to no emotion. 
So if you're very pleased, I'm happy. If you're annoyed and even decide to walk out, uh, hey, that, that also tells me something. So uh, that, uh, anyway, with that uh, start, let me begin with the human mind, a few quotations about the human mind. Overconfidence. And I you see, I'm, I'm setting myself up here, OK? <laughs> Overconfidence. Uh, the human mind is an overconfidence machine. Um, there's nothing that people apparently don't think that they know, that they can do, and so on. So we'll, we'll delve into this as the, as the talk goes on. Playing God, the God complex. A God complex is an unshakable belief characterized by consistently inflated feelings of personal ability, privilege, or infallibility. And I think all of us know someone with whom we may argue on occasion who seems to be absolutely unshakable in a certain belief. Okay? It's called the God complex. And then, of course, there's the bliss of ignorance, and a quotation here from Daniel Kahneman. And if you haven't read this book, you really should. It's called uh, Thinking Fast and Slow. It's absolutely readable. Uh, he is a psychologist who won a Nobel Prize in behavioral economics. Uh, his uh, quotation is, um, our comforting conviction that the world makes sense rests on a secure foundation, our almost unlimited ability to ignore our ignorance. Another one, another really great uh, book that I took this quotation from uh, about evolution is impossible to understand how the brain works without also understanding how it evolved. So if you want to know why people do things that they do, why somebody behaves the way they do, just go way, way back and figure out what the survival uh, um, pluses or minuses were of that particular behavior. Um, a little bit of Greek. And either, orti, within, either. Uh, can you read that Greek? Can you Socrates. read this? Yeah, so Socrates, of course. Socrates or Socrates. It means the only thing I know is that I know nothing. So I'm coming to you here with a clean slate. I really know nothing. Okay, and I, I, I feel quite humbled. And, and actually, the more I learn, uh, the less I seem to know. So um, that's, uh, that, that definitely, and he said that a long time ago. You want to be creative? Question everything. Anything you don't question is going to be an opportunity that you've missed. For example, you may have watched TV um, when uh, Tropical Storm Isaac was, uh, was, was going through the Caribbean. Uh, on TV, I noticed, for example, the cone of uncertainty, the so-called cone of uncertainty uh, around New Orleans. Um, a couple of days earlier, the cone of uncertainty was over here. It was headed for Tampa, if you recall. Now, how could that possibly be that the cone of uncertainty two days earlier did not include this? What kind of cone of uncertainty is that? But most of you, if you saw this, would just say, oh yeah, that's, that's interesting. Oh, it's uncertain now, and tomorrow it's uncertain over here. Well, to me, that makes no sense. <laughs> and here's another thing. Uh, I was actually watching TV, watching the, the, the um, exodus from New Orleans, just before Hurricane Katrina. I remember saying to my wife, that, you know, it's a good thing everybody in New Orleans has a car, because there was nothing but private vehicles, cars coming, streaming out of New Orleans. Continuously, private cars, private cars, private cars. How many people were watching? How many people in, in military people, police, security, everybody? They didn't notice that there were no buses coming out? Well, we know what happened to the buses. They all left behind, they were left behind, as well as the people who don't have cars. Now, if, if those things don't strike you, then you're going to have a hard time with creativity. You, you, that, mean, that means questioning everything. Never take the obvious for granted. Every time you take the obvious for granted, you miss an opportunity. You can't take absolutely everything, and you'll go crazy, of course. 
Now let's look at Google. Google, they're, they're visionaries, aren't they? They really know where they're going. And the, the founders of Google knew what they were doing. They knew where they were going. I'll, I'll come to that in more detail in a moment. But for example, innovation never comes from the established institutions, according to Eric Schmidt, the CEO of Google. But Google is now an established institution. Subtext. Don't expect anything new from us. If, you know, if I was a stockholder, I'd sell all my shares right away on news like that. He obviously had no clue what he was saying. He says, it's always a graduate student or a crazy person or someone with great vision. With a great vision. Well, doesn't anyone in Google have great vision? So you, you, you have to question that. In fact, uh, I noticed this first in Daniel Kahneman's book. Apparently, the founders of Google were willing to sell their company in the early days for less than a million dollars. But the buyer said the price was too high. Vision? These guys are creative. These guys are visionaries. These guys are entrepreneurs. How come they missed that? Uh, of course, now that they're working on augmented reality, maybe their vision will be clearer. Um, but I can see clearly now the rain is gone. I have augmented reality glasses, which of course Google is now uh, uh, um, you know, making available. Um, so presumably they'll have better vision for the future. This is a quotation that, I, that struck me and I put into my PhD thesis in the 60s. Uh, this is by the psychologist uh, Herbert Isink. If we make up an ad hoc hypothesis for every new case, then we shall never go beyond the present position where we can explain everything and predict nothing. Isn't it odd when you talk to people, how they seem to be able to explain everything? Oh, well, this is why it happened, this is why it happened, this is why it happened. That's called explaining everything, predicting nothing. What are my objectives here? I want you to try to get across some kind of feeling about the creative process, understanding people, why they behave in certain ways, improving research productivity, making the most of time, making the most of money, and of course, most of us would like to make a mark. What's the target audience for this talk? Student, professor, the, the team, the budding artist, innovator, entrepreneur, and of course, I hope there are some administrators uh, here and members of the public who are footing the bill for much of the research that goes on. Uh, uh, so they're also part of this target audience. Speak the truth, but leave immediately after. Uh, after this talk, I'm ducking out of here while you guys can go and get coffee and uh, stuff. I'm, I'm leaving. So that's a very interesting proverb. Impressions. This is the book on uh, snakes in suits, a very, uh, very readable book. Perceptions of you by those in power, that is your reputation, are based on the impressions you make. You, you think your reputation is based on your, 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 your technical knowledge or your artistic ability? No, it's based on the impressions you make. And those impressions can sometimes be impressions that are made in 10, 15, 20 seconds. And it can even be destroyed without you ever being aware that someone has any doubts about your competence or loyalty. Anyways, a small aside here, if you go, I, I have some stuff on my stuff on YouTube. Um, there's a talk, an IEEE TV talk that you can also uh, go to that is in the same style as this. And uh, this my art, this is my, my, my money, okay? I call it my money. Um, anyway, just to give you a, a, a taste of, of, of the background. To, uh, to what I'm talking about. Let's, go for, let's immediately go to a case study. Let's be very specific. And this happened so long ago that I don't think anybody would mind me uh, uh, giving the, the, the inside information on this. I told you there's going to be something from the inside. Uh, one of my most uh, brilliant PhD students, Hani Abdel Malik, who, who is now uh, in Egypt, he was my student in the 70s. The nicest person you could ever meet and uh, it was just an absolute pleasure uh, working with him. He was here from 74 to 77. He came to me uh, three months after he arrived and told me he'd got a very low grade in his control theory course. And I called the professor and said, what's the story on why did he seems to think he got too low a grade? Well, he did very, very well in his assignments, but he really fell down in his final presentation. He fell down. Okay, so that was that. 
something clicked, something, something must have gone off in, in, in his brain, because on, at, at his initiative, uh, before, we were to before he was to present uh, two, of, two of our papers uh, at an international conference, he had completed his presentation and, was, and wanted me to watch his rehearsal two months before we were actually there, two months ahead of time. He made those presentations and the big shots in that conference got up and shook his hand. Wow, that was a fantastic presentation. That was their first impression. I had the uh, misfortune to ask him to take over an undergraduate class while I was away. In the course evaluation at the end of the, at the, at the, end of the term, one student said something that will, I, I can never re erase from my mind. It said, fire Bandler and hire Abdel Malik. Okay, that's their first impression. His PhD comprehensive exam, you get the questions in advance, you have two weeks to, to, to look at them, uh, you make presentations to a committee of examiners and then they ask you questions. He made such an impression on three out of the four uh, members of the committee, I was just an observer there, I, I, I had no say in it, uh, just as an observer. He made such a spectacular impression on three of them they actually voted to end the examination at the half-time undergraduate level. They said, we don't need to go on. This guy's answered these questions at every level. We just said, let's just stop. It's a waste of time. One person said, no, 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 no. I, I don't believe this. I, I, I don't believe it. I, I insist to, to, that he goes through this. This is completely unorthodox. And uh, it happened to be that same professor he made that impression on years ago. I mean. If any, I mean, I can go on and on about this. I don't know how much more you would need to be confirmed in the belief that first impressions are absolutely important and they can take years to change. This is an absolutely clear cut case. A playwright's opinion, I also write plays. Are you, I take advantage of the writer in residence program here at McMaster almost every year. And uh, this playwright, who is an award-winning Canadian playwright, wanted to see all my works. I said, you want to see all of them? Yeah, send me all your plays. Okay, send her all my plays. Overall, we spent about seven hours discussing plays. One of the plays she focused on, she said to me, you can't just repeat this line of dialogue here. It doesn't work. It doesn't work? You can't repeat the line of dialogue? So I thought, that's something, I, I, I just... I couldn't get that through my head. I left, I thought about it, I sent her an email and I said, look, I want to know where you're coming from. Can you suggest a play uh, that I can read that we can sit down and discuss so we can understand your benchmark, your, where you're coming from here? And she suggested Death of a Salesman, uh, her uh, 20th century benchmark play. So I read it. I had no idea what I was going to discover. Um, but I discovered about 10 instances of lines being repeated almost word for word. And then I discovered on page 121 of this book, there's a dialogue between the two, two key people in that, in that play, Willie, the father, and Biff, one of the sons. And Biff says, I've got no appointment, Dad. On the next page, Biff, I've got no appointment, Dad. The line is identical. And uh, when I brought this to her, and this was the 11th instance, except that this one was a verbatim, uh, 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 verbatim uh, identical uh, piece of dialogue, her jaw hit the floor. She was so, uh, my interpretation is she was so determined to crush me that she took something that she absolutely flipped around. She had to say something. Oh no, you can't repeat this line. Well, I said, if you repeat the line, well, you'll say it differently. The actor would put different emphasis because obviously it hadn't gone around. Anyway, uh, she was thunderstruck. I had, I had literally unmasked her subtext. Subtext. And what, what her aim was. Again, this is all about the creative process. My, my, the thing that I'm leading up to here is you have to be very careful even about what experts tell you. You really have to be absolutely careful. They're not always right. In fact, most of the time they're wrong. Most of the things I am known for are things I have been actively discouraged 
from doing by the experts. I, act, I almost crave to be rejected, because then I know I'm onto something. <laughs> universities. Gaming the system. Games universities play. This may annoy some administrators here. Games universities play. We can increase enrollment, university people say, without sacrificing quality. Really? Tricks professors play. If class sizes increase further, we'll all suffer. Yet course grades and research output are as robust as ever. How is that possible? Threats by certain professors. If we don't upgrade our lab equipment right now, our students and our prof professional standing will suffer. Yet the curriculum remains accredited and course grades are as high as ever. So are these people, all these people that I've mentioned, just don't take in all the details here, but are all these people colleagues? Or are they co-conspirators? somehow to perpetrate some kind of fraud. Budget, the small budget. I'm talking again about creativity, entrepreneurship, innovation, and so on. The small budget forces initiative and imagination. I can give you countless examples of this. The mega budget is a crowd pleaser, an ego booster, and a horrible resource waster. I can give you lots of examples of this. The insufficient budget, of course, wastes people. The optimal budget, JR, what can you say about the optimal budget? The one and I see that's what we're, we're all aiming for the optimal budget. Clearly, you're looking for the best of all worlds. You want to have enough pressure that you are forced to. Yes, but the question is. Okay. Okay. It has yet to be discovered. I don't know anyone who thinks they have the optimal budget. Okay. You and your budget, being creative with your expense accounts. Do you stay in more expensive hotels while on business than when you do on vacation? All those who don't, put, please put your hand up. If you stay in, uh, if you don't stay in more expensive hotels while on business when, when you're on vacation. Do you ride in taxis while on business but otherwise take the bus? And when was the last time that you actually paid for a business lunch out of your own pocket? Good, well, okay, nice, nice to have a uh, few people. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you're going to have to pay a lot of money out of your own pocket. It's very easy to put your hand into someone else's pocket. Size matters, as the cliche goes. So let's measure success. Let's, as universities do, let's be creative. Measure success by the number of enrolled students, the size of the department, the size of the team, the size, uh, the number of publications, volume of citations, the awards received, and so on, the size of the budget, right? That's, well, let's measure success by that. In short, let's measure success by the size of just about anything a bean counter can count. So, and no wonder people spend so much time trying to figure out how to measure anything, like something to do with human beings. Measuring success, okay, you want to be successful, measure success. Well, it could be output plus input. Right? You have so much output, and input like money, and output like products, whatever they may be in your profession. Or well, it could be output minus input. Or, or it could be output times input. I can give you examples of many of these. Or output divided by input. Or any kind of measure of output and any kind of measure of input you want. Uh, in short, like everyone else, be creative. Use any formula that fits your agenda. So I'm asking here, I'm uh, inviting you to be creative accountants. Okay? Use any formula, because that's most of the time what we do. Okay, action. Here's some things I think institutions should uh, actively encourage. Solitary researchers as well as research teams, curiosity and creative failure. How often have uh, uh, institutions actually encouraged creative failure? I think also pr flexible uh, proprietary rights, commercial exploitation and so on. Preparation, presentation, packaging, communication, collaboration, citation, a lot of these things are sadly ignored. And here's something that might uh, raise a little bit of anger among some of you. Institutions should actively discourage too many published papers, too many low-level conferences, too many supervised students, too many trips, and of course, bureaucracy. I mean, the minefields, 
navigating the minefields in any kind of uh, creative endeavor, ethics, overexposure, secrets, confidentiality agreements, envy. What about proprietary rights to the student's thesis, to the professor's work, pirated books, movies, and software? People are actually proud of pirating books, movies, and software. And I warn anyone that if I were in a position of power and I heard that any one of the people working for me was pirating books, movies, and software, it gives me a golden opportunity to fire them any time I want. And it doesn't matter how many other people are doing the same thing. Think about that. You want to be successful? You have to combat fear of all kinds of things. Uh, fear of failure, fear of inferiority. I can give you an example of someone who is just afraid of publication, afraid of success. You can't be successful if you're afraid of it. Now, let's come to subtext. Any chance of having sex, you may ask. In our everyday experience, we are filled with thoughts we never speak, and for good reason. If we did, we would get sued, divorced, fired, beaten to a pulp, and lose any chance of having sex. So there's a lot of things that you're thinking right now, at this very moment, that you wouldn't dare say. You just couldn't bring yourself to say. That's part of subtext. OK, I'm going to start to pick somebody from the audience now and ask a question. Obama, what's Obama's subtext, President Obama? There is no speech that justifies mindless violence. Yeah. What, what's the clue there for Obama's subtext? Which word would you say would signal something that you should think of that, that, that tells you something about, yeah, it isn't, you know, whatever, whatever comes to your mind. What's that? I think yes, I think justifies. Okay, anyone else? Anyone else want to guess? Which one? Mindless. Mindless. There is no speech that justifies violence. Sounds to me a little bit more precise. You know exactly where there is no speech that justifies violence. Mindless tells me something about his subtext. Tells me who he is. Because what he's saying is my violence is always calculated. It's never going to be mindless. But if you just accept there's no speech that justifies mindless violence and just go on with life. You're being brainwashed and you're not, not creative. George Mitchell, Senator George Mitchell, the notion of poisoning your own people, I think, is something that is repulsive to everyone. Anyone, what, is, what, is, what, what, what are the key word or words that signify the subtext here? At least, sorry? Your own. Okay, yeah, your, your own, exactly. The notion of poisoning people should be sufficiently disgusting for him. Right? right? Subtext. It is sometimes essential, I think, to poison people other than your own. You'd never think that. You'd say, oh, jo George Mitchell, you know, it sounded nice. It's, oh, he's doing this. So you realize when you think about that, you go back, that's just propaganda. Because we, we the good guys, we don't poison our own people. No, no, they poison their own people. We poison people, though. It's sometimes necessary. <clears throat> Teamwork. A leader's responsibilities to share failures as well as successes, share ideas, and so on and so forth. It's also a leader's responsibility not to hide good ideas, plans, not to hide rejections, not to blame others for things going wrong, and of course not to plagiarize. You want to be a leader? Stop blaming other people for the problems that you have. Entrepreneur, you want to be an entrepreneur? Requires access to resources, must have freedom to act, must tolerate frustration and pain. Enterprise, always be prepared with an elevator speech. Look it up on the internet if this is a new expression to you. It's, uh, now, I hope some of you know Rupert Murdoch. You've heard of Rupert Murdoch and the scandals in Britain about phone hacking and so on. 
here is my elevator speech to, to, to Rupert Murdoch uh, in, in the elevator at the Plaza Hotel in London where I managed to get a free room and I happened to be in an elevator with him. I say, hello, Mr. Murdoch, I'm John Bandler, scientist, engineer, and I can save your empire from collapse. He better look at me at that point, right? So I'm, I hand Murdoch my business card. Phone hacking is old hat, sir. Strictly for low-life losers. My privacy invader cyber protocol is turnkey, tabloid cheap, and ethics proof. If he doesn't want to spend another five or ten minutes with me, uh, there's something wrong with him. Here's another one. Um, I'm pitching hypercomputation to Bill Gates. Hi, I'm John Bandler, a genomatics engineer. Give me just 10 minutes, Mr. Gates, 10, and I'll show you how I program ubiquitous waste and common dirt to self-assemble into ready-to-operate hypercomputing nanochips. Of course, this is total fiction, but if he, fiction or not, he'll want to speak to me for the next five or 10 minutes. That's, a, that's called an elevator speak, uh, pitch. If you do any commercial work, let's say you're a university member, you do any commercial work, to keep a paper trail of expenses. You must incur significant expenses. I bet some of you say, that's good, yeah, I can incur significant expenses, of course. I really can. Out of your own pocket. That's the, that's the downer, sorry. It has to be out of your own pocket. And you've got to keep a paper trail in case somebody comes after you. If your pocket doesn't feel the pain, if your brain doesn't feel the risk, you're not an entrepreneur. You're an employee. Someone's paying you a salary. You may be a psychopath, of course, if you don't feel anything. But that's another story. You're a scientist, in engineer, academic. You're not an entrepreneur, right? You're just a scientist. Isn't that enough? What are you selling? Let's say you're in an elevator with your university president, the reviewer of a recent paper or proposal, et cetera, et cetera. What's your optimal course of action? Okay, you're on an elevator, remember? Elevator pitch. Um, is it silence, a cough, a remark on the weather, excuses for a misdeed, a snow job, a compliment? Uh, or is it your perfect elevator pitch? And if you haven't got that already in your mind, you'll miss that opportunity. You'll come away and say, God, I was with the president of such and such and I totally forgot what I was going to say. I had nothing to say. On your next important visit, you must overcome confirmation bias, make a good impression, and understand and manage subtext. That's also the subject of another talk. I can't go into too much detail on this. I have a number of complimentary talks to, to this one. You have to be prepared with specific facts and questions about the establishment you visited, you're visiting, the business, the products, the department, and so on, the competitors. Make sure you are remembered. Again, make sure you are remembered. Don't go away and be forgotten. Ridicule. Beware of experts who claim to see no future in your proposed research. If you follow your pining instinct and find yourself uh, ridiculed and rejected, just keep on going. Many of the experts in my field have been totally wrong and all the stuff that I'm known for was initially rejected. Fearless, like a virgin. A virgin being fearless, okay, that sounds like a contradiction. We have been fearless about taking on new businesses, sectors, and challenges, even when the self-proclaimed experts told us that we didn't know what we were about. Richard Branson, I think he's fairly successful. Uh, a good friend of mine, Jim Rautio, some of you know him, he may not be known to others. In defense of uselessness, uh, he wrote an article about this. Uselessness should be defended. We don't always see usefulness in advance. That's a picture of me around 1970. I, I, once, I was once uh, canvassing for a political party, and I knocked on the door. The door opened. I handed a flyer uh, to this person, and I said, can I interest you in? And the person looked me up and down and said, you couldn't interest me in anything and slammed the door in my face. In 1969, I was a candidate for a position at McGill University. They told me that they were rejecting me on arrival, but they still expected me to go through the whole business. And uh, a professor sabotaged my seminar. 
New at McMaster University in 1969, I entered the faculty lounge, as it was then called, and the faculty member yelled from the extreme opposite end of the course so that everybody could hear, you, yes, you, graduate students aren't allowed in the faculty lounge. Um, I don't think this guy was particularly creative, and certainly he used or misused his first impression. Success. Uh, John Vlachopoulos, a chemical engineer here at McMaster University, uh, sent me an email which said, soon after arriving at McMaster University, I was asked by Ab Johnson, who left in the early 70s to become Dean of Engineering at the University of Western Ontario, about what I was planning for research. I told him that I was planning to combine con continuum fluid dynamics with molecular dynamics for polymers. He quickly retorted that it has been done. Forty years later, this topic has become the holy grail of all those in polymer processing, and my only regret is that it proved more difficult than I had imagined. But for Ab Johnson, it had been done. Rocketry pioneer uh, Robert Goddard was ridiculed for his theories concerning spaceflight. The New York Times believed that thrust was not possible in a vacuum. Computational methods, programming software, definitely not engineering, and it hurts our students. This was the wisdom of the 60s and 70s. It's hard to believe now. Then why is this man so rich if all that stuff was hurting our students? You, the experts, or many experts in electrical, even com computer scientists, were actually saying uh, it, it hurts students. Here's some highlights from my career. In 1967, a senior academic declared that my proposed research into computer-aided design had already been fully explored. This is in 1967. Don't go into this. It's already been fully explored. In 1974, experts predicted that my work in computer-aided design with tolerances would never prove useful. In 1985, Raytheon Corporation hired me to work on com computer-aided design with tolerances. In 2004, I received uh, an IEEE application award on computer-aided design of tolerances. In 1993, I told Hewlett-Packard representatives I wanted to link their so-called HFSS system to my company's optimization software. They openly laughed at me. I was ridiculed. In 1997, Hewlett-Packard bought my company. Uh, my company was called Optimization Systems Associates. A uh, couple of things from, a couple of highlights from there. At Queen's University in Belfast, my one hour seminar ballooned to three hours. I actually arrived and I said, I know this seminar is only supposed to last an hour, but most of you will still be, this was at five o'clock in the evening, most of you will still be here at eight o'clock in the evening. And I could just see the, 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 the mood. If he thinks we're staying until eight o'clock, he's wrong. I, I, actually, I was right. They did stay. At Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, I had 10 minutes to do a pitch, uh, and they wanted to hear me for two and a half hours. They didn't want me to leave. At British Telecom, my software benchmark Hewlett-Packard software, I was told. And then in Santa Rosa in 1997, Hewlett-Packard bought my company. Uh, slight technical um, uh, digression here, space mapping, something that I've been working on for the last uh, 20 years. Um, it has something to do with this. We can talk about it later. Space mapping it happens to explain the engineer's mysterious feel for a problem. So that's technically what I'm onto right now. Let's look at failure. I, I was wrong. I, I can give you lots of things I was wrong about. In, 19, in the 1960s, um, if I actually paid attention to what I saw on my, on my uh, spectrum analyzer screen, I might have become a pioneer in chaos theory. But I was told, no, no, you, you, don't, want, you don't want that. That's not what you want. You want this. Yeah, but why is that happening? It doesn't matter why it's happening. You're an engineer. This is what we want. I was also wrong about the future of digital signal processing, and I also thought in the early days that personal computers were toys, even though I was in computer-aided design. I, was under the impression that those big mainframes were the, uh, uh, the tool of the future. Secrets they won't teach you at business school, Richard Branson. It's imperative that you understand your competition. Avoid being overly negative. At best, you will seem humorless and self-important. And if you think you don't have any competitors, think again. 
So, Mike Lazaridis. Anybody here who has not heard of Mike Lazaridis? You haven't heard of Mike Lazaridis from Research in Motion, the Blackberry innovator? No problem. It's okay. It may not have come to mind. Good. Some of you, at least many of you, have heard of Mike Lazaridis. Perhaps he was wrong, and I heard him say this myself with my own ears because I asked him the question. He said, in an answer to one of my questions, RIM has no competitors. So that was the, that was the philosophy, clearly the philosophy of the company. Now the BlackBerry Z10, according to the Globe and Mail, March 22, 2013, there are no lineups and the stock is down as BlackBerry Z10 lands in US market. But of course, Mike Lazaridis doesn't think he has any competitors. Nortel Networks, uh, I can tell you an awful lot about this because I was closely involved with them over a long period of time. Uh, and I could actually see their decline. I, I, I bought shares in Nortel at 35, watched them go up. When they started coming down and I, I was involved, so I was an insider in some remote way, I could see them coming down. I sold everything at 70. Of course, it went up much higher than that. So Emperor Nero plays his violin and Rome burns. Nortel plays musical deck chairs while its Titanic sinks. And I, I mean that seriously. Every time I went to Nortel, they were handing me new business cards. Oh, we're in this department. Oh, I'm manager of this. Oh, that's interesting. And, and the interesting thing is with every technical talk that I gave at Nortel, nobody could ask a single question. We had a big audience. And with my collaborator, I, 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 I said uh, as we went to our rental car, don't they, can't they ask any technical questions? What's wrong with this crowd? They couldn't formulate a single technical question. So if you go to this website, don't, look at, don't read all this. The important thing about this website is Nortel initiated bankruptcy. Now let's come to Steve Elop, who's a little closer to home. Some of you may have heard of him in more contexts than one. He was actually an undergraduate student here. Um, he's the CEO of Nokia. But master undergraduate. And if you look at this stuff at the bottom here, I actually hired him to help us evaluate our first graphical user interface for filter optimization. So I had personal interaction with him in uh, around 1985. He gave a talk to a huge audience here in 2011. He kept touting Nokia's answer to Apple and Android. The word RIM or Research in Motion or Blackberry never passed his lips. He's Canadian. He's a CEO of a gigantic company. Research in Motion is Canada's sort of flagship uh, company. And he can't even say a word. And there were apparently uh, members of, of BlackBerry or RIM in the audience. Never crossed his lips. So obviously he didn't think they were a competition. And again, if any, if any of you were there and, and, and you think I'm wrong, let me know. So don't suppress the wiggles. They're telling you something. So listen to all of these things. Be really alert. Don't take anything for granted. Inspiration. Here is, here is my, um, uh, here are some of my uh, sources of inspiration. Um, snakes in Suits, Incognito, uh, Richard Branson, and so on. And Stephen Hawking, this other, but that's a different talk. I, I've got some references here on some of the uh, uh, quotations that I've taken. I haven't finished yet. This is sort of a little pause for the moment, so don't run away yet. Uh, Tim, thanks very much for the invitation. And Kiruba, I don't know if he's here. I haven't seen him. Um, we discussed doing this particular talk. Acknowledgements also to Cheryl Guys, uh, who prepared all kinds of stuff. I don't know if she's here right now or not. And Shasha oh, QS Cheng, who's sitting right here in the front seat. John Vlacopoulos, who would have loved to have been here, but he's uh, in Europe uh, right now. So, my finale, is your creativity on the brink? Relax, a powerful tool is working for you. What is it? Your brain. Good. Let's see. Your brain. So, you don't have to, you know, it's still working while you're relaxing. Don't crush your unconscious, let it work for you. Place makes a difference. Trigger new associations by changing locations. If you are constantly sitting at your computer and you're looking in one direction, your cubicle, I, I don't think you will get as many ideas as if you wander around and go to different places. And see, when you invent something, when you, when you, something new happens, 
You want to be in a place that is unique, that you can so associate with it. If you're constantly in the same place, looking in the same, at the same thing, and you get something that seems inspiring, it's very much more easy to forget it if, if, if you don't have something else to relate it to. So change your location frequently. Stop accepting what you already agree with. Stop accepting the obvious. Uh, agonize over things you don't agree with. Keep your CV short. Check your emails for subtext. You know, I, I don't know how to short circuit this, but it often takes me 20, 25, even 30 emails before I can even have a cup of coffee with somebody. I wonder why that is. Would you like to meet? Yeah, when are you available? Oh, on such and such a day. Well, where would you like to? It just goes to and fro and to and fro. And I think the reason is we're afraid of subtext. We are afraid of pushing that button with perhaps too much information where that the subtext is carried by email. And so what happens is we go into an endless loop of, of that. Subtext, le bourgeois gentilhomme, Molière. Have you done this one, Tom? OK. Uh, a, a famous uh, line is uh, this uh, gentleman is surprised and delighted to learn that he has been speaking prose all his life without knowing it. So all of you here have been using subtext all your life, uh, maybe without knowing it. Right? Now, I've left out a lot of things. The stuff in black are things that I've covered. Uh, things in red I haven't really touched on interviews, meetings, auditions, and I can talk about snakes, and how to manage confirmation bias, first impressions, and subtext, and all the lessons you can learn from, from, psychopath, from the psychopath. So I've talked about the elevator pitch, experts, and ridicule, case studies, and of course the monumental errors of judgment that I think I've illustrated, and I also indicated how creativity might be triggered. You have a new idea, right? You go and tell someone. Person understands it right away. Wow, that's great, excellent idea. Is it really new if it's that easy to understand? I would distrust that. You want to have an idea and you want to go to a number of people, say, what? I said, That'll never work. Impossible. Because the moment you, uh, you go to people and say, you know, what do you think about this? And they say, yeah, that's a great idea. There's probably 100,000 people around the world already doing it. Your next breakthrough is staring you in the face. But you don't see it because you don't see the obvious. You don't, you don't question this. You don't look for inner meanings. For example, my Sony uh, Alpha 77 features in-camera special effects. And I asked my collaborator, Cheng, who's sitting right here, sinking lower into his seat. I asked him, is it useful or not? Says, oh, no. He says, Photoshop can do all that. No hesitation, case closed. Photoshop could do all that. You don't need special effects in your camera. And I know how long I spend with photo. I, I do a lot of Photoshop. The simplest thing takes me hours and hours and hours. Okay. Interestingly, Facebook bought or buys uh, reputed to have bought Instagram, a company at that time with no revenue for reportedly $1 billion. And one of their features was in-camera special effects and instant uploading to YouTube. To, to Facebook. Now, wouldn't Sony have loved to have had a cheaper camera than the one that I have, the Alpha 77? They brought in these special effects in a very high-end camera. So, proceeding in a direction not sanctioned by my peers has almost always proved tough, but the results have almost always been worth the effort. Success along that well-trodden path is a tough slog, and there's a, it's crowded, okay? If you find yourself in a big crowd, then you know you're on a well-trodden path. If you find yourself alone, isolated, craving company, then you might be a pioneer. So from creativity to success via risk and setback. I had a whole list of uh, 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 things, and I was sort of, in a sense, implying choose one of those uh, as to uh, what might be useful. In fact, everything is useful. Uh, imagination, facilities, opportunity, naivete, and hi hindsight, charm, favors, uh, everything. Plus optimism. 
the optimism bias, the hard work, trial and error, pleasure. You better, be, you, you better love what you're doing. And permission to fail creatively, which is something that we tend to try to stamp out. People are afraid of failure. If you're afraid to fail, you won't be creative. And vulnerability, this is at the very bottom, the shame factor, vulnerability. I can give you examples, and by all means, when, when I throw this open, uh, you can ask me questions. Tell, me, so tell us about vulnerability. You have to make yourself vulnerable, very vulnerable, and, it, and it's frightening. It's frightening. It's easier to talk about creativity over coffee. Yeah, one of these days, I'm going to be creative. But when you're actually in that mode, it's frightening. Thank you.